The Texas Parks and Wildlife Television Series is supported in part by Texas Parks and Wildlife Foundation, conserving the wild things and wild places of Texas thanks to members across the state. Additional funding is provided by Toyota. Your local Toyota dealers are proud to support outdoor recreation and conservation in Texas. Toyota, let's go places. Coming up on Texas Parks and Wildlife. A quick and easy way to use the coals from your fire to make an oven out of a pot. Casting. Whoa, got him. All right. <laughs> Say the magic words. RV. Good. Nice. <laughs> that was awesome. Texas Parks and Wildlife, a television series for all outdoors. On a crisp February morning at Cleburne State Park, south of Fort Worth, a group arrives to get set for their monthly meetup. Right. While they have an almost religious devotion to their gathering, this is not a church group. And while they share some specialized knowledge, it's no secret society either. In fact, sharing their secrets is part of why they gather. These folks are members of the Lone Star Dutch Oven Society, That's good right there. the Chisholm Trail Chapter to be precise, and they are preparing for a dog. When we get together, it's called a dog, a Dutch oven gathering. That just means they're about to fix lunch. We cook and we eat and we talk about cooking and eating. <laughs> should be really good when it comes out. The Dutch oven is a cast iron cook pot, but not just any. It holds a special status in Texas, shared with the blue bonnet, the mockingbird, and the pecan tree, among other icons. The legislature even named it the official cooking implement of the state of Texas. In case you didn't know we had one of those. They, they burn really well. Lavoy Oats is about to make the official state food in his. We're gonna be cooking chili. My wife can't eat real spicy chili, but she's not here today, so I'm gonna spice it up a little bit. Yeah. When the cats are what? That's it. I'll mix all that up. Then add a little cayenne pepper in this one here anyway. But we don't add beans to it. No, no beans. You're in Texas. That's right. So it's called chili with beans. Chili don't have beans, no, but doesn't. this is chili with beans. That'd be good. It's just a Texas thing. You're right. <laughs> You know, some people kind of get upset being in Texas. You don't add beans to your chili. Every third Saturday, we just get together and cook, and it's just something that we do uh, just for fun. Step aside, diets, and make way for the casserole. We're cooking chicken Alfredo casserole, chicken cordon bleu casserole. It's just a beanie weenie casserole. Chicken enchilada casserole, Mexican rice, and a butt cake. Oh yeah, and the desserts. Bread pudding. Also a crumb cake. Anything that you can cook on your stove at home, we can cook in a Dutch oven with one exception. And that is ice cream. And Rick Alexander proved that out here one day. Can't cook ice cream on your stove at home, but I can make it in a Dutch oven. He made ice cream in a Dutch oven. You sure did. <laughs> There's always a lot of variety. There's a lot of different dishes. And then I'll add my secret spices to it. And it's really not secret. It's just uh, garlic salt, onion flakes, uh, oregano. You reckon I could try that when you're done? Yes, sir. All right. The skills that they're teaching are skills that have been used for literally hundreds of years. This is the same sort of cooking that someone may have done on the Chisholm Trail, which runs right through here. Kind of associated with the cook on the on the cattle drives on the chuck wagon. The ovens came west with the pioneers. When um, pioneers and travelers would travel across the United States, it was a quick and easy way to use the coals from your fire to make an oven out of a pot. 
and uh, it's been modified and tweaked and perfected since then, but it's still the same basic techniques. Those techniques still work very, very well today. This type of cooking is a little more precise in that you're using briquettes. They put out a certain amount of heat. You can use a certain number of briquettes and get real precise with your heating. They call these camp Dutch ovens. Okay. So if it has the ring in the legs, it's called a camp Dutch okay. oven. And they put the ring on there so it'll hold the charcoal. They've been coming here for years teaching Dutch oven techniques and sharing their experience and sharing their food with visitors here at the park. The number of coals in that ring it's pretty close to the diameter of the pot plus four. It's not really complicated. It's just, there's just a few tricks and things that you learn to do that makes all the difference in the world as to whether or not you burn something, whether you get it completely done. And we'll let that simmer there for a little while. It takes about 15 to 20 briquettes to cook your entire dinner. Add one to the top and one to the bottom for 25 degrees. These people are absolutely amazing. That looks really good. Just after noon, cooking is complete and pots are lined up buffet style. Some curious visitors, perhaps drawn by delicious aromas, are welcomed to join. We're eating lunch. You want some lunch? You're welcome. It's all cooked in the Dutch oven. Yeah. Yeah. Go right ahead. And you're welcome to eat with us. They always invite people to try what they have cooked, to call them, email them, and, and learn the trade. They've been asked to do this demonstration monthly somewhere else, and, and they choose to keep coming back here to their park, Cleburne State Park. And we're just thankful to have them. <laughs> Recipes and laughs are shared, and a few new folks are introduced to an old way of cooking. The food is really good. We have a lot of fun, you know, cooking outdoors. I think the number one thing is just the people. <laughs> food, fun, and fellowship, that's what it's all about. Needless to say, no one leaves with an empty stomach. I like to say if you come to one of our events and you go home hungry, you're not doing it right. <laughs>
You can hear him. He's hungry. <laughs> There's stuff in the trees. Look, 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 look. There's like eight of them. Look who's on the corn on the cob. A green jay. Look at that. Whoa, get it. <laughs> That's awesome. That I can go to the outdoors and have something to do. And it's something, um, you know, it's kind of relaxing and peaceful. You can just need your binoculars and you can do it anywhere. So that's what I like about it. And you know, the birds are neat, you know, to see different birds. Hey, look at all those chachalacas sitting there. It's not very bright, but I like the noise it makes. It'd be a good ringtone, wouldn't it? Yeah. Chachalaca, chachalaca, chachalaca. <laughs> My favorite probably is the green jay. I know that's kind of like the the hallmark of South Texas down here. Everybody will come from miles around just to see that bird. It's just cool. A lot of them are, are like camouflage or blending in, but that one really pops out. See the Altamira Oriole there? It's beautiful. Look how orange and black. And that's just down here in South Texas. I actually enjoy being outside and looking at nature. Now it flew away from the feeder. There's all kinds of different species, so they they have different colors or different bills, or they're just larger or smaller. Oh, on this right hummingbird feeder is another golden fronted woodpecker. You see it? Yeah. Drinking that sweet nectar. When you see the top of the head, see that little red top, red spot on the top of the head? That's a male. That's pretty clever. Wow, there's a lot more birds than I like realized. So now I'm like looking at birds more, I guess, than I had before. So it's it's fun. <laughs> this is South Texas, it's Mother Nature. Kids need to understand that and learn how Mother Nature uh, provides for everybody out here. We are at the Prairie Rose Ranch. It's kind of like a paradise. You don't come out here and stay up tight. I bought Lake Emma in 1990. We name all of our lakes after our dogs. We did a lot of fishing and duck hunting, and it was just fabulous from the beginning. Got a fish earlier, David. You did? Three and a half pounds. Wow. Yeah. Nice. And I've always been interested in conservation. I like it to be as close to natural as it can be. And I think the fun part is just seeing it go back to the way it was 100 years ago or maybe 1,000 years ago. I mean, that's my philosophy, do what's best for the wildlife. The grass is sure green and pretty this year. It is, it's coming in. Now we planted some of this too for the deer. Mm -hmm. Ron's a joy to work with. In the last 10 years or so, he's worked very hard to reopen some of these areas to allow the, the native grasses to come back in to restore a more open oak savanna habitat, which was here historically. I've been very impressed with Mr. Gard's holistic approach to land management. Friends of mine told me once that I must be part beaver because I'm constantly damming up every ditch or creek that I can find. That way there's a lot of water for the wildlife and wildfowl. The thing that gives me the most joy is taking other people fishing. Casting. Got him. Get in that net for Ron. Oh, he's pretty. Good job, Ron. All right. <laughs> he's in perfect condition. They really get excited when they catch a fish. There's a lot of people that just don't have the opportunity to get out and be close to nature. That's probably why I do photography and taking pictures of just about everything. Properties like this help to preserve 
that habitat so that our future generations enjoy wildlife and nature and being outdoors. That's been my most important thing probably of my life other than my family. Now my son would say he enjoys as much as I do. David does most of the hard work while I supervise him. <laughs> That's a lot of fun. You want them to continue when you're gone. You want them to continue taking care of it, doing really good work for conservation. That's what it's all about. When moving through the field, you're either here or you're here at all times. Never here, never down here. Okay. My name is Ashley Taylor. I am a native Texan. I've lived here my entire life. You okay. now have a live loaded gun. I have a background in education, and prior to what I do now, I was a principal. Oh, geez. Okay. I've never even shot a shotgun before. All right. I did it. Oh, well, that's new. I am excited about giving it a try and it's just something completely outside of anything I would ever do prior to this. I'm Josh Crumpton at Spoke Hollow Outfitters. So in my 30s, I was pretty interested in the um, sustainable food movement, which in a roundabout way led me to hunting. As I got into it, I realized that I really had a fuel and a passion for introducing people to hunting, bringing new people into the outdoors. Sometimes the bird is going to fly right at our face. You're going to go to shoot it like this. It's going to come go over your head. Instead of doing this, you get in the process of doing this. That makes sense to me. Then I'll turn this over to you. OK. Well, and I guess, too, that you have to know what birds you're allowed to shoot to, right? And when you're allowed to shoot them and when you're not. And... There's so much more to it. When it comes to hunting, I really have no background, um, really no experience. Oh, go on. They <laughs> were right in my face. <laughs> oh, it just, again, it just happens so quickly. Like, oh, there he is. Oh, God, it's right there. I don't want to shoot that way. I got to be ready. Working with Ashley has been fantastic. I don't want to miss the bird. A lot of times we get people who come out, and in one day we cram in a lot. We go from clay shooting to into the field to shooting birds. But working with the stewards program and, and having Ashley as a mentee has given me an opportunity to really, over a few months, really talk about the dynamics of shooting. Do it. Nice. There yes. it is. Yes. <laughs> Good job. Nice. <laughs> yeah. Sally here. Sally here. Oh my gosh, I Harvey. did it. Dead bird. Harvey. Dead bird. Here. Sit. Oh, right to you. Sit. sit. You want to sit first? Sit. sit. Hand on it. Good boy. You can tell it to him because it's going to be really cool to follow Ashley through this yeah. season and, and watch the challenge get turned up each time. I have a bird in the back. I am so excited right now. Ready? Yes. Really I want to keep going. Keep <laughs> yes. Going? Okay. I love it. Good. Ready? Follow me this way. Harvey, come on. Get used to this idea of keeping track mentally. Of where All the moving the parts, are. yeah. <laughs> Last year, my sister went on a mentored hunt. And on the hunt, she was talking about how it had completely changed the way she viewed hunting and viewed hunters. And so, you know, I really wanted to be a part of that. I wanted to see what it was like. We got a dog on point in front of us. Okay. Keep moving. Right. Here. Keep moving right there. 
now call. Oh, it, there's two right here. Okay, now call for RV. So they're gonna go that way or at my face? Maybe at your face, but I'm gonna get down. <laughs> go ahead, you're in charge, boss lady. What? <laughs> Say the magic words. RV. Good. Nice! <laughs> that was awesome! <laughs> Tell him dead bird. Dead bird, RV. Heel. Sit. Good boy. Drop. Good boy. I worked with Stewards of the Wild. We volunteered our time, provided our dogs, and helped this mission to get more adults into the uplands. What a day! I'm nervous. Nothing new out here than anything else we've done before. Just more challenging. Let's go get your bird. So we're gonna walk from here all the way along that cliff band behind us. Okay. This is super humbling. <laughs> I got birds above me, and I got one single peeled off below me that Ashley took a couple shots at that we might be able to run that thing down. Over. Jonathan's like, oh my god. <laughs> this hunt was so different because we were always on the move. You have to be ready to move quick. Do it again. There's a lot of youth programs out there, and youth programs are critical, but there's not enough adult-focused programs like this. Yeah. These are adults that have families. Ashley has kids. And these are also adults who can immediately start to support conservation efforts. And now she's out there to support and grow the mission. So we recruited one more person. And I feel so blessed and so grateful to be a part of this. Hi, I'm Heidi Rayo, Hunter Education Specialist with Texas Parks and Wildlife. Let's talk about safe zones of fire while hunting. When hunting in a group, each hunter has a safe zone of fire. This is an area where you can safely take a shot. If you shoot beyond your safe zone of fire, this could have dangerous or deadly results. It's easy to find your safe zone of fire. Start by focusing on an object ahead of you like a tree. Hold your thumbs up and slowly bring them to the side of your body until your thumbs disappear out of vision. This is about a 45 degree angle and the area where you can safely take a shot. This is your safe zone of fire. It's that easy. If you're hunting with another person, be very careful to never cross into that person's safe zone of fire. In fact, no matter how many hunters there are, even one hunter, you should never swing outside of your 45 degree safe zone of fire. Another thing to think about is target fixation. When a bird flushes, you can easily forget about your surroundings and your safe zone of fire. If you're excited and only focusing on your target, you can quickly lose track of your safe shooting zone. You can even lose sight of buildings and roadways. This is very dangerous. Bottom line, don't let target fixation override your sense of safety. Firearm safety is your responsibility, so always be aware of your safe zone of fire, even when you're excited. We always want to enjoy safe and memorable hunts.
This series is supported in part by Texas Parks and Wildlife Foundation, conserving the wild things and wild places of Texas thanks to members across the state. Additional funding is provided by Toyota. Your local Toyota dealers are proud to support outdoor recreation and conservation in Texas. Toyota, let's go places.